Welcome to the Informed Simplicity Project, a place for learners. This is an ISP short. And if you enjoy this podcast, please tell a friend and leave a review in iTunes. Okay. Today we're talking about polyvagal theory from Stephen Porges. We had uh, Deb Dana on the podcast a few months ago talking about this. And I just went and did a deep dive in polyvagal theory. I watched Pessy's five hour training clinical applications of polyvagal theory by Stephen Porges, and it was in. Incredible. It was incredible. And the importance of this is for the first time, for the very first time, we have discernible, identifiable cues of safety. As therapists, we all know how important it is to create safety for our clients in the room. But if you don't know what the exact cues of safety are, it makes it very, very hard to meet that those needs and to create safety in the room. How do you know? Many of us can't tell when a client is um, being really, really still because they're afraid or being very, very still because they feel safe enough to explore their own ex- experience. So what is polyvagal theory? Polyvagal theory um, is sort of in contrast to the old way of viewing the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system controls basically automatic parts of our bodies, breathing, heart rate, digestion, all of these different things and typically when we think about these we think of the sympathetic nervous system which speeds up the nervous system right this is what happens this is the part of our nervous system that gets activated when we are in fight or flight and we can and we compare that and contrast that the, the sympathetic nervous system with the parasympathetic nervous system which slows us down which helps us to be calm if we if 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 any of you teach kids how to breathe, how to do belly breathing or like five, seven breathing, you're trying to trigger the parasympathetic nervous system. And what Stephen Poor just discovered is that the parasympathetic is actually split into two branches. One branch for safe and social and another branch for freezing. Now, where we get stuck, where we get stuck is when we go into freeze. So Porter says that our, our autonomic nervous system is actually structured like a ladder. At the top, when we are in a positive parasympathetic response, he calls that safe and social. That's when we're able to engage with other people and regulate our emotions and feel calm. And he says this is the state we have to be in in order for our bodies to naturally heal and grow and recover. But if we are met with any sort of threat, we drop down into fight and flight. We drop down the ladder into fight and flight. And we all know the sorts of things that we get into when we get into fight or flight, right? Our thoughts race, we get anxious, we get angry. Um, We wanna fight, we wanna run away. It's pretty, pretty common stuff. But sometimes there's more than a threat. And there's more than just a challenge, sometimes We are literally terrified to death. We think we're going to die. And this is when our bodies switch out of um, fight and flight and go into freeze. And freeze uses the same ability of the parasympathetic nervous system to slow us down, but to do so in a way that causes us to faint, to um, black out, to dissociate. And Porter says that for mammals, there are two really important things to know. When we go into freeze, it is hard for us to come out of it. It's hard for us to come out of it. That's the first thing. So being in freeze is very, very hard on, on our bodies, physiologically. And secondly, he says that when we go into freeze, as well as fight or flight, this all happens outside of our perception. He calls this neuroception. Our nervous system has made a decision outside of our conscious awareness. And so when we uh, find ourselves in these situations where we're just sort of frozen and we think back later, why didn't I do anything? You really didn't have a choice. Your body was doing what it had to in those moments to protect you. I hear this most common with my female clients who've been assaulted. And a lot of them think, man, Why didn't I do more? Why didn't I try to get away? Why didn't I try to move or get out of there? The answer is your body in that moment 
said, I'm probably going to die. So the best way to handle this is either to pretend to be dead, which is what, which is what fainting is, or to dissociate so I don't have to feel it. And so when we do this, it's incredibly, incredibly adaptive. It's our body's best shot at keeping us alive. So how does this play out clinically for us? There are certain things that are innate cues for safety, and there are certain things that are innate cues for threat and for danger. So when we're looking at cues for safety, one of the innate cues for safety is a melodic human voice. So what this means is, if you want to trigger and signal to your clients that they're safe, check in with your tone of voice. Is it one that is melodic, that goes up and down, has a bit of a sing-song, sing-songy quality to it? Or is it flat? Or is it really, really deep? Because if it's flat or deep, that's an innate cue that you're not a safe person for your client to, to be around. And if you flip it, the opposite is also true. By listening to the quality of your client's voice, you can tell whether they feel safe or not. If your clients feel and they're a little um, mobilized, the voice will probably be deeper or really, really high pitched. If it's high pitched, they're signaling that they're in distress. If it's deeper, that signals that they are feeling like they, they're being attacked and that they're trying to move more into fight in order to protect themselves. If the voice is flat, it means that they're probably more on the free side of things and they're a little bit um, in a place where they don't feel like they can mobilize energy if they need it. Another big cue of human safety is when the muscles around the eye are triggered. These are the same muscles that make us smile. Genuine smiles are defined not by the smile on our mouth, but by the crinkle in our eyes. When that happens, those are innate cues to people that we're safe. And on the flip side, when there is no movement and the muscles around the eyes and up, that means that our clients are probably more in a freeze re response. They don't feel safe enough. They have to be a little bit dissociated to be in, in the room. And this is why RBF, flat face, stonewalling, um, are all cues to us that something isn't right. If you have ever been up in a group of people giving a presentation and everyone's just staring at you, their faces are probably flat. And that flat face then is an innate cue that we are not safe. And another cue of safety is the client's ability to hear. When we feel safe, the muscles in our ear actually change so, you keep, so that we can actually hear human voice. But when we don't feel safe, the muscles in our ear change so we, keep, so we can hear low tones and sounds, which are usually the sounds and tones of predators. I see this, I see this all the time now with my son. He's really young. Now, whenever it rains and then it thunders, he gets, he gets afraid it's because those low tones are innate cues that there's a predator around that he's not safe. And so what does he do? He usually comes running to me or to his mom. Now, what is therapy then? Therapy is, the, is a neural exercise, that's what Porter says. Therapy is us bringing safety into all aspects of the client's life. And so when someone can safely go into fight or flight, that's what we call play. When he, told, when he says this, it blew my brain because I can definitely think of people that I knew in college that we'd be playing intramural sports with and they'd be freaking out, taking it way too serious. There are other people you play with and you just have so much fun. And that's a very clear picture. It's a picture of someone who can either go and go into fight or flight with safety and play, or they take it as though it's an actual threat. And if we can take safety into freeze, into immobilization, that's when we get intimacy. That's when kids can feel safe in the arms of their mothers. That's when me and you can feel safe in the arms of our lovers and of our partners. And that's when we can feel safe enough to dissociate safely through meditation or, or hypnosis or other sorts of um, 
mind-body experiences.